Hello, everybody. Chris Martinson here. And today we're going to be talking about finance and economics as part of Finance U. Remember, anything that you see in this video and all resources available at our websites or affiliated websites are not intended as or construed as financial advice. This is for educational purposes. Remember, if you have a financial decision, please consult a financial professional. We are not attorneys. We're not CPAs. We are not financial managers as well. We do our best to be accurate and everything we represent is as accurate as we know it to be. Now, let's turn to our program. So one of the things we have to do that's considered custody over the assets, you have to have surprise random audits on the accounts that you, you do that. And that's important because it verifies and makes sure that the client's best interests are taken care of. Why can't we, as the people, like you said, be able to verify that the Federal Reserve is doing what's in the best interest of the American people versus the best interest of those in their circle of influence? Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Finance University. I am Chris Martinson, CEO of Peak Financial Investing, back here with Paul Kiker. We're going to discuss all things market. We're going to do it in a way you can understand, and we're going to do it with high integrity because, hey, you matter to us. Paul, good to see you again. Good to see you, Chris. Lots of things to talk about in the past week have happened. Wow. I know. <laughs> I know. Um, so... I am, and this is not investment advice, and I have to be very clear, everything we're talking about is educational. The people often ask me, Paul, hey, Chris, how much do you have in gold and silver? Like, it's one word. It's not. They're two words, gold and silver, <laughs> separate words, right? Because yes. they, they occupy different parts of my thinking, right? One's a monetary metal, the other's an industrial metal. It could have monetary uses again, but let's be clear about its current use. Um, and... And so they say, hey, how much do you have? And that sounds suspiciously like financial advice. So here's what I will tell people. I am irresponsibly long both. <laughs> and I have been since the early 2000s. Because <laughs> that, that's just how I go. So um, here we are. I want to talk about gold today and what it means. We can talk about silver too. But gold, because it's signaling something. Paul, I've been watching this market ever since I first invested. I remember my first purchase. It was in March of 2001. And I've added to it consistently over time, um, dollar cost averaging in. So I've been watching this like a hawk. And in the last year, we've seen things happen in the gold market that are off the reservation. They haven't happened before. So I, this is a change. And I want to talk with you about what these changes might mean because they have implications for everything. The dollar, our portfolios, bonds, everything sort of hinges on this. So let's start there. It, has gold caught your attention this week? Oh, big time. Go, of course, yeah. gold's one of my favorite positions. And, and again, anything I say today is not advice. You've got to do your own research or talk with a financial advisor so we can talk freely about this. But yeah, gold's been on my radar for some time. But quite frankly, you know, we've been at resistance since 2017. We got out of the 2012 resistance and, and we've struggled, we've struggled, and we kept getting closer and closer. And now we've had this big breakout. Now, Chris, quite frankly, if if you'd have told me three years ago, said, "Look, interest rates are going to have a, a, a an incredible increase in a short period of time. The U.S. dollar is still going to be strong. The economy is holding up well, well, based on the data that they're giving us. Um, you know, gold's going to break out to all time highs. I would have bet against that. Quite frankly, I would have bet against it. So every typical signal that's you know dollar strong, interest rates high, that's caused the dollar to fall in the past has not mattered at this time. So this breakout is a big, big deal. And, you know, a couple of weeks it ago is. when it broke out at first, I was like, okay, can we hold, you know, then we held, are we going to retest? And now we've blown through that 3% level on the breakout. So this is a gold is signaling something major. I can't figure out what it is right now, but there's, you know, it's telling us something is going on under the surface because, you know, you look at, you look at the media just in the past week, crypto, Bitcoin, all time high media's you know rah rah re this is great it's got so far to go all the reasons why it's going much higher 
but then they talk about gold and they're like, oh my gosh, this is the end of the run. There's no way it can be here. You know, they, they give this illusion or they talk about it like, you know, don't touch it because you're going to be, you know, buying right at the top, but go chase the cryptocurrency because, because it keeps mm -hmm. going higher. And oh, by the way, we happen to get fees off of that from our advertisers and gold doesn't necessarily share any fees. So a little cynicism from my standpoint there, but but I think it's a big deal. Something's going on under the surface. And the interesting thing is, if you look at the GLD holdings and, and money flows, this isn't retail. This does not appear to be retail. I've looked at all the data. This appears to be institutions and big money that's making this move because your normal early morning smackdowns of price just aren't occurring right now. Um, now, I got an email from, from a longtime gold dealer who said that right now they're not experiencing uh, retail buying. In fact, it's five to one retail selling. Really? And this gentleman's been in the business long enough. He was there for those double lines around the block, 1980, $50 yeah. silver, all that stuff. Right. So he, he's a, he's an old dog been there, done that. But he said, this is, this is what bull markets look like. Retail mm -hmm. isn't in it. Big money is right. And that's how it always happens to be. So let's, let's look at this first. This is a long-term monthly chart of the price of gold. Can you see my, my, my little cursor moving around? I is sure that can. Showing up. Yeah. Sure so can. here we had, um, so this back here, this is where I started buying, you know, and I bought through all of this. This was, oh, remember this, this great collapse of 2008. That was just like, boy, I was gnashing my teeth because we went from about a thousand, you know, down to whatever that was, 600 and change. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have this big rise up here into 2011, 12, 13, top, top, top down. And this makes what we call the cup. This is the cup mm -hmm. in technical language for anybody who's watching. <laughs> And then this is the handle, right? And then we had a failure of the handle. We came back up and we were bouncing here, just bumping this 2000 line. And now we're out, right? So this is, uh -huh. this is on a monthly version here. I see a cup and handle with a big breakout. That's a classic technical sort of a, of a position to find, right? Uh -huh. But let's look at this again now where we happen to be, that we are here over 2300 at the time of this you know, recording here between you and me. And mm -hmm. silver's actually started to get in the game too. Now over 27 and it's been, let me just show you the weekly on this because silver has been range bound for a really long time. I and mean, we might say it still kind of is. This was, um, I hate these ads, uh, 2020, the big crater into March popped back up. And at, even despite all of the money printing and stocks off to the races and everything, blah, 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 nothing <laughs> happened. Silver just bounced range bound between 20 and 25, mostly forever. So let's just put it in context. So silver is there, but it has not yet participated even close to what we've been seeing in gold. But I agree with you. This gold breakout means something. So it means something. Let's talk and, about and, that. And in addition to that, Chris, so you've spent six years in a consolidation phase working off, you know, that move and building. So the, so the buyers have been steady. And the sellers have been steady so that you've had this battle back and forth. And now you've got the buyers that have won and that's without the retail. And we've seen what, you know, retail can do to stocks like NVIDIA. You know, the ETF market comes out and offers a two times NVIDIA ETF out there, you know, and, and the only calls I'm getting from your typical, you know, I, I tend to have groups of clients who are good indication of what's taking place on the fear of missing out and whatnot. And they'll follow our lead, but they're in their initial indication is like, oh, you know, let's go buy. What do you think about this two time NVIDIA ETF? I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So when retail's not involved in this, can you imagine what the price velocity to the upside is going to be when retail realizes, hey, you know, maybe we were chasing the wrong thing. And and especially that's even without um, even without we have some event that gold's preparing for in the background that 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 is not on anybody's radar right now. Mm hmm. Well, uh, what do you think that might be? I mean, we've had all this talk, Paul, about the BRICS and yeah. that's Brazil, Russia, India, China, plus the S. There's a lot of there's a lot of countries in the S now. I think at last count there was over 70 so the BRICs are lining up. They say that, you know, they would like to have an arrangement besides the dollar. They felt like the dollar has been unfairly weaponized or it's been used in a way that doesn't feel right or fair to them. So they would prefer to have their own system of trading. Uh, obviously, very hard to set up a, a, you know, de novo, just stand up a reserve currency. So the talk has been out there for a while that, you know, 
maybe they stand up a system and there's some gold or full gold backing in that system. What do, what do you make of that talk? Uh, well, I mean, gold's telling us that there's obviously could be something to it, right? Like price action doesn't necessarily tell us exactly what's going on in the background. But mm -hmm. when you hear talk of that, and it makes sense to me, Chris, because quite frankly, you know, if you and I were doing business at the same bank and you said, hey, you know, they got upset about something that I said, I spoke the truth. So they mm -hmm. locked down all my accounts and seized some of my assets mm -hmm. and, and I can't get them until I go to court. Well, oh, by the way, that keeps getting kicked down the road 10 or 15 years. You know, with, with what we've done in our abusive position of power in the U.S. as the global reserve currency, you know, talking about seizing a sovereign, sovereign assets to pay for a war against them without due process of law, unfortunately, we're not trustworthy anymore as a country in, in having that position of power as the global reserve currency. So, you know, I had somebody make the comment in the ministry that we were supporting years years ago still like to support but they shared the story with me when the pain of changing is easier than the pain of staying the same someone will change right mm -hmm. and people have to reach that rock bottom point so yeah the pain of changing and replacing the dollar on the global reserve currency is just an, an ridiculously complicated web and it's so embedded across the board but the reality is what choice do they have at this point and if they don't trust each other as much as what the U.S. was trusted until we betrayed that trust, what's the best asset to utilize to back your currency, right? Whether they allow it exchangeable for citizenry or not doesn't matter. But if you have uh, sovereign exchanges, kind of like, and China set the precedent, you know, do business with us and buy our oil and wine, and you can exchange it for gold if you choose to. Just that gives peace of mind to these sovereign entities. And and if you look at the recklessness of our budget in the U.S., our fiscal irresponsibility, mm -hmm. you know, hey, we're going to be fiscally irresponsible. We're, we're going to tell you that we're fiscally responsible. They're lying on a consistent basis. They're not uh, following the rule of law. And gold mm -hmm. is the next best asset that they could ex exchange between each other. So I don't know if that's the case. But with gold breaking out like this at this point, it, it leads me to believe that that someone or something or somebody has enough information that they're like, you know, I'm not going to wait the dollar cost average into this anymore. Let's go ahead and start making some purchases, even if it moves the price out, because because we're either close enough to an announcement of some sort or they're concerned enough about what's taking place. So I, I think this breakout is huge. I just wish I knew what it was telling us so you could prepare in other areas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you yeah, think? Yeah. What, what did you speculate that it's telling us, Chris? Oh, um, well, so, so, let, uh, all right. I, I agree with all of that. And I'm going to throw this speculation and I'm going to turn now to an, a true authority on the subject. Um, and so this is an article by uh, Jan Nieuwenhuis, and I hope I'm pronouncing that close to right. This came out August of 2023, August 25th, and he's talking about an important change unfolding in the gold market, right? The East has been driving up the gold price. Now, I've been talking about this um, with, with, with others for a long time, watching this West to East flood, right? So we okay. sell the East buys, right? And by we, I'm talking, it's really the London and the New York markets. You have to understand how those two markets have, have really locked down the price of gold. I think they've done it for narrative control. They're trying to treat the symptom, not the cause. They don't want the price of gold to send an inappropriate signal to so, show that maybe people have lost faith in the fiscal prowess of government or it's monetary printing by the Fed. So they've locked the price of gold down, but the cost of that has been a severe hemorrhaging of gold from hemisphere to hemisphere okay mm -hmm. so so with that um he's sort of tracking that through this was a really important chart so this is tracking uk so this is london the monthly net gold import so if we're above this zero mark up here that's a positive net import and if we're below that's a negative net import so gold is coming into london gold is heading out now this doesn't say where but look at this relationship. When the price of gold is rising, which is this black line, gold is coming into London, right? Mm -hmm. It's coming in. As soon as gold's price starts to fall, gold is hemorrhaging out of London again. So some of this just represents the, the regular arbitrage you get, right? So 
you know, comics is this price uh, for paper gold and then, you know, physical gold in London is this price. And so people will buy and sell and it kind of moves back and forth. A lot of this import export has been just kind of flushing the accounts back and forth um, as they wang the price of gold around for their management project. So, but here we can see the price of gold is heading down. Gold is leaving London that whole time. And then it pops this little tiny pop right here. And next thing you know, we have this big import surge right into London. Price comes down. We have this little negative territory starts to sort of crawl its way back up. Mostly positive. Price goes down. Negative. Price is going up. Very positive gold inflows. And then it pops down here coming in through that 2022 part we just talked about. And as the price of gold is coming down, again, it's hemorrhaging. And then here, this is the part encircled by, by Jan. See the price rising strongly here, Paul? It's still leaving. That's it's astonishing, still actually. heading out. And again, this is a very long-term gold chart. So we're looking at, um, you know, 15 years of history here. And this last year has been a complete break in that behavior. Mm-hmm. And that gold, my, my concern is the gold that's leaving the West and heading East will not come back. So, yeah, so this, this, that last year, Paul, that, that is such a huge break in the behavior to see the gold price rising this strongly. And there it's, the gold is still leaving London, not flooding in. It's actually still hemorrhaging. That's a big deal. Well, you know, you know, what's interesting is, is the best opportunities are the ones that people aren't paying attention to, right? Mm -hmm. The biggest problems, the canaries in the coal mine are also the things that the market's not paying attention to. The market seems to be ignoring gold. So, uh, and one of the things I like to track, and let me make sure I've got this chart in here is, is the premium. Um, so the, uh, uh, gold trust premium versus discount. So let me share my screen with you so I can show it to you here. Um, and which, uh, is this the big bar premium, like the comics premium, or is this a, a coins at the shop? What are we talking about here? This is just the Sprott physical gold premium discount. So it's easier for me to track. Oh, okay. For the, here. Yeah. For the Sprott, they have a fund, they have a gold yes. fund so and they have a silver that, fund. And I know it's not perfect, but it does give you some indication. So if you go back and look at, you know, 2021, when we had the nice uh, price spike, if you can mm -hmm. see my bar here, I know it needs to be larger. Yeah, I can. But we went we went positive shortly there for a period of time, right after the spike in 22, 2022. But look at the spike that we've had here recently, and we're still at a discount on this Sprott, you know, physical premium and discount. And I know that's not a perfect indicator, but it is an indication of what's taking place out there right now, and the fact that that you know here we had this massive move and gold broken out of resistance that goes back for quite some time. Oh. I hit the wrong button. Goes That's back, all right. Saw it. Goes back for quite some time, and there, there's still no uh, premium that's in, in, you know, just a sentiment indicator that we can see from a retail side. So yeah. that's something that I've been watching. It's quite interesting, you know, we, we look for that. Once that spikes positive after a period of time, you know, then you can trim some positions back, take some profits if you need to rebalance other parts of the portfolio. But right now... You know, there's no indication that we need to be taking profits here in the short run because that breakout <clears throat> with that consolidation that's taken place over many years and just this much of a lack of attention and this much chasing Bitcoin and cryptocurrency leads me to believe that this is going to be a good asset over the years ahead. Not a recommendation to those of you that are out there. You got to do your own research or talk to an advisor. But from my personal perspective and, and even in our portfolio perspective right now. Yep. Yep. Now. Uh, great points. Let me bring this up, which is a continuation of that Jan Uyenhuis uh, article in Gainesville Coins. But this, again, just to speak to how, how different this is, how, how big of a change this is. Um, so uh, notice here in this chart, this is two things. In blue, we have the 10-year U.S. tips yield. That's Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, for people who don't know. And it's supposed to track the price of inflation, you know, plus a, a yield that it's modified by inflation. And of course, gold is an inflation hedge. And as well, as yields go up and down, you have uh, an impact on the dollar or vice versa. So in gold is also the anti-dollar. So what they do is they flip the 10-year yield on the tips, right? So that's an inverted scale on the left hand. Mm -hmm. um, and then the dollar gold price is on the right hand scale. And you can see clearly, clearly that starting back here in 2006, these things are highly correlated. 
highly correlated. Yes. Very, very, very tightly correlated. Uh-oh, something breaks right here in early 2022. That's a huge change in trend. So we got back to the BRICS, Paul. You know what happened on February 28th, 2022? Why? U.S. Treasury announced that they were freezing Russia's sovereign reserves, proving they were neither sovereign nor reserves. And you mentioned earlier that you can't just go about breaking the rules and changing them on people just because it feels important to you. That's not how contracts work. That's not how business works. Well, no. you can do it. Yeah. But guess what? When people don't want to do business with you over time, that's what this chart is saying to me is that gold suddenly departed from this long standing. By the way, I could run this chart back another 20 years. Mm -hmm. And it just, it looks exactly like that. This is profound. That's what I want to alert everybody to, a real change in trend. And it started when the United States probably did the most ill-advised, stupidest thing I could think of, which was to weaponize the reserves of central banks. In this right. case, weaponizing it against Russia, saying we're going to seize that because you did something we don't like, leaving aside that maybe it's not all that indistinguishable what Russia did for, like, why, why is the U.S. in Syria? We're in Syria. They didn't invite us. Nobody no. wants us there. We're there and we're squatting on the oil producing region. Yeah. Anybody ever write articles about where all those oil monies are going? Because oil's coming out of the ground. Yeah. Nobody ever talks about that part, right? So anyway, I'm just glass houses, stones, usual story, right? Yes. But but we did that and then we didn't back down. We didn't think about it for a month and go, oh yeah, that was yeah, we were we were kind of drunk and um not thinking clear. We're sorry. No, we're persisting with that idea that mm. we can weaponize those things. So all of a sudden, what do you do? What do you do if you're China and you're sitting on a trillion dollars of U.S. treasuries? I you would start very... thinking that through. You start stroking yeah. your chin, you know. You well, have to. I... Or you... <clears throat> yeah. yeah, what what I would do personally is I would reinvent, I would recycle those U.S. dollars in the, in the productive farmland in the United States. I would recycle it into building manufacturing mm -hmm. bases inside the United state, States, and I would start accumulating gold and preparing myself to be, you know, independent and build a build a mirror system that you could replace at any point in the future. And what I wonder is if in the future, because we won't know for a period of time, right? We've got mm -hmm. we've got we've got road markers that we're going through now, but they're not as clear as driving down the road. Are we going to look back and say, that's the moment that the pain of changing became easier than the pain of staying the same? Because, mm -hmm. you know, you can disagree with someone, but if you still respect them, then you can still have a relationship, right? But, but if someone hasn't earned that respect because they lie, they cheat, they steal, and they operate like a third world country and seize assets without the rule of law, then now you're no different than any other third world country. So you're going to have to take over the, the reins or take over that position yourself and build a better system. Yeah. You know, if you, if you want to have the world's reserve currency, you have to, there's a set of rules that go along mm -hmm. with that, right? You can't be that and capricious and arbitrary and fickle, right? You, you've got to pick one, right? So, Correct. so that's the issue. So this is a really big change. And, and so the, the thing I want to alert people to at this point in time is that this is profound. I don't know everything about what it means yet, Paul. Um, but I have worries that it's going to be, we're starting to see weakness in the U S treasury markets, right? We're starting to see that inflation is, is actually structurally mm -hmm. part of the game right now. It's not going away. Like we thought, we know that we're lying about inflation anyway. Whatever it is, just double it, and you're far closer to the truth than whatever is reported by the government. So this is, and this is that's true in Europe here, in the U.S. as well. So that's what we're up against right now. And so the concern I have is that um, eventually you sell enough of those treasuries out there, things are, are, are going to get tough on the funding cycle. And so let, let's, let's pull back to one, one more piece in this story which is uh not that and it's it's energy we got to talk about energy real quick here oh yeah energy's energy market was down energy was up yesterday yeah well well you know they're, they're working pretty hard to, to keep energy contained in the u.s that like like you know we know that that biden is the first president in my lifetime that's day traded the price of gasoline right they sold the spr that's our strategic petroleum reserve you know <laughs> that that's like that's like What'd you do with your rainy day fund? Oh, I gambled yeah. it. Yeah. You know, I put it all on red. 
You know, it's just come on. Anyhow, this is a big deal because this is the price of oil. So here we're looking not at the international, which is Brent. This is WTI, West Texas Intermediate. And you can see here from back here in March where it was at 80, right? It's just been a pretty relentless rise. We got things going on in the Middle East. There's supply issues. Stuff is going on. But, but that's just in the past week or so, a little over a week. We've seen that. We come back even further. And we see that it's gone from about 67 here to 85. So that's about a 30% rise mm -hmm. in the price of oil. Now, Luke Groman really um, uh, cued me into this, Paul, which is he said, look, if you're one of these countries that's holding dollars and you also have to import oil, the more the price of oil goes up, the more you're gonna just at some point go, oh, I guess I, got, I need dollars because I use dollars to buy oil. My dollars mm -hmm. are in treasuries. So he said, as you watch the price of oil go up, you're probably going to see more and more pressure on treasury yields just because, just like somebody who's tapped out at home and can't afford the rent payment, you know, you, 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 you sell what you got um, mm -hmm. to start participating. So the price of oil is also something that I, I've been saying for a long time, people, you got to watch this. And that's exclusive of any craziness that might get kicked off in a Middle East conflagration. That's, that's different, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that would, that's just, that's a plus in this story. That would be the death now. Can, you know, you know, what's interesting and in, and the 10 year recently broke out, the 10 year treasury re yield has broken out. I mean, you've had a rise in yields across the board, but the outlier based on what I'm looking at is the 10 year. I'll share the screen here so you can see it, mm -hmm. uh, has broken out above the highest level compared to the others, you know, going back to November, December last year. Now it's nowhere near as high as it was back in 2023 when we got up to 4.9. But, but this is a breakout right here compared to other areas. This is the five year. It's not broken out of that high. You've got the uh, two year that's in here. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're starting to see a little bit of indication of that, of what he's talking about there with oil prices going up and yields on the 10 year going up. Cause that 10 years are very important. Uh, uh, right. It's a very important right to watch. That's interesting. Yeah. So, so I, a, another way, if we wanted to look at it this way is, you know, oil and gold and treasuries are all telling us that the expectations in the market have changed towards mm -hmm. the switch is flipped towards inflation. So this then would be almost a perfect repeat of the 1970s. Remember, we had a burst mm -hmm. of inflation. It started to come back down. They had to whip inflation. Now we're winning. And then, uh oh, it really got bad. So maybe there's a, 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 a an inflation cycle that you know we're just in the midst of. That's that's how it works. But also this time, Paul, we got to be honest about this. That thing where the Federal Reserve printed four and a half trillion dollars because of COVID. Ooh, ooh, that's a self-inflicted wound. We're going to be living with that one for a while, for quite some time. You know, and going back to 1973, what's interesting is the market stretched out to new highs uh, in '73. You know, and everything looked good, and then inflation surged back, and you had a 57% decline, 47 or 57. I can't remember. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 50%, just to be as general as I can be, um, in the market, which caught a lot of investors off guard. That ended the nifty 50 kind of craze that was taking place, and, and then it was years later before investors actually really understood how the opportunity that was in the market, you know, from that point forward. So that's not outside the realm of possibility here. So this is mm -hmm. a, you know, one of the things I've really been looking at is just trying to watch indicators, trying to listen to what price action is telling us, just trying to look because you've got a lot of certainty with investors out there. They, they, you know, are behaving like they know for sure that the fed's going to bail us out. Right. So, there's a couple of questions that I have to ask myself. You know, my thesis has always been, we're going to have the event could be like 73, 74. If worst case scenario unfolds where the market goes down 30 or 40 or 50%, and then they come back in and say, Hey, we bailed it out during COVID with print and money. Let's just do 10 times that. And their arrogance to expect the rest of the world is just going to tolerate it or to be forced to tolerate it. And then you have a currency crisis. So that that's kind of been my working uh, theory. But then, I, but but then, with all these, you know, gold breaking out, and you've got oil prices breaking out, and you've got other assets that are breaking out. Commodities are starting to break out at this point in time again, with you know near panic moves in the short run. When you go back and look mm -hmm. in the in a shorter period of time, it's like okay, 
well, I don't want to be stuck in this thesis. What if these are the early signs of a currency crisis already? What if we're already in the early signs of a, you know, not necessarily a hyperinflationary event, but leading to that? And what if that market decline is behind us? Now, that doesn't mean that your NVIDIAs are going to continue to run at the pace that they are right now. I mean, that thing has so much momentum that it's a fool's errand to try to determine where the peak is going to be. I think we're going to look back in the past and there's going to be a lot of regrets from investors that have been chasing it. But there are other asset classes that are far better to own than some of these large cap stocks if we have that type of event. You've got your commodities across the board. I mean, cattle prices have broken out to all time. Live cattle futures have broken out to all time highs again. So, you know, the markets are telling us something but the king of those commodities and the king of the safety trade and the inflation trade, who is gold, is telling us something major is going on under the surface. And and it doesn't appear to be a false move because we have clearly broken through that uh, resistance level. We have cleared that substantially and above the 2300 price level now. And nobody's paying attention. I mean, we are because this is the world that that we pay attention to, and and you know it's on our radar across the board. But your average retail individual is just ignoring it at this point. I I agree, and and so this is an important reframing. I think this we're getting to this stage of the story where where people have to stop looking at the absolute numbers, and you got to start looking at relative numbers. So so what do I mean by that? A lot of people say, oh, the dollar, the dollar, you know, the dollar. Well, the, you, when you say the dollar, you're just comparing it against the, the, the euro, the Japanese mm-hmm. yen, the British pound, which we see on the screen right now, et cetera, right? And look at this. Nothing's happened. This is kind of where it was. It's going to go up and down. You know what? Um, each one of these is a skydiver falling at a different rate. So mm-hmm. I don't measure, I don't care about what the dollar is doing relative to other fiat currencies at this stage. Mm-hmm. So... If you said, oh, the dollar, you know, the dollar's still strong, everything's fine. I'm like, well, no, that's just measuring it against the euro. (laughs) How's the dollar doing against (laughs) copper, wheat, oil, Mm -hmm. land, cars, healthcare? How's it doing against the things that you actually have to spend it on? And the answer is, oh my gosh, today, compared to to the when gold was $1,800, it's down like 28%. My dollar has lost 28% of its value relative to gold so that that's part one it's just the relative measured against real things and the second is people like oh you know i bought fifty thousand of gold but now it's worth 60 no 45 like how many ounces do you have that's the right question (laughs) yeah that's that's the right question and continue to average in a little bit you know i mean that's that's the safest way to, to increase your exposure and to gain exposure to something as time goes along you know, one mm-hmm. of the, you know, I, I don't know how true this is, but I've got a, a an acquaintance that's in the institutional money management space, and I'm like, I ask questions all the time. I'm like, why, why, with what we're taking place, and this individual believes in gold from a long term standpoint, like, why are you not allocating to that from an institutional uh, point of view? He said, well, everything has been driven by momentum. He said, so we need a three year look back before we really start chasing as far as allocating resources there because you know all the data shows something carries momentum for three years it tends to carry it for a little bit longer than that and he says you know gold's just not had enough momentum in any metrics that we use to to demand an asset allocation he says we may do it as a special idea in there but he said basically all of the mutual fund space and you know typical wall street money out there is going to be that kind of momentum chase or herd mentality so based on that explanation if that is representative of what's taking place on wall street and institutional money we're still probably at least 12 to 24 months away before they start chasing it so this breakout could really be the bleeding edge of a major bull market that's going to reward those that are involved and especially you know, if you're like me, it's like I look at it and I'm like, okay, when's the SmackDown coming? <laughs> right? uh-huh. You know, it's like, I don't want to get my hopes up. You know, it looks good here. Yeah. But, you know, if, if I remove that, you know, just my own, you know, personal feelings and I look at the data, this breakout's big. This, this, is, this is big. And it, and it has legs, apparently. Now, I don't know what's going to happen here in the short run or how long it's going to last. But, but it is something that, that continues to, to be an important piece in the portfolio of those who've had good advice to help them get there. 
I think I said it that way without it coming across of advice. Talk to your advisors, right? Because I, I can't yeah. make this blanket advice across the board. Well, I, I'm wondering if we aren't at that part of the story, Paul, where uh, th that I've been waiting on for like 20 years, right? And it's been far too long of a wait. I'm really annoyed that we have people in positions of authority who are busy manipulating markets because it's never a good time to have a crisis. And we want people to think the right things, not the wrong things. We wouldn't have people to get dollar hesitancy, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, so, so they, they do all their stuff instead of just saying, wow, why don't we just let natural signals be your scorecard? And mm -hmm. if you don't like the scorecard, change what you're doing. Stop printing. Stop bailing out Wall Street. Stop throwing taxpayer money into boondoggles. Stop it, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so we haven't had that corrective measure for a long time. And I always thought that corrective measure was going to have to be some outside force, like a three-year-old throwing a tantrum. Somebody's going to have to like, you know, step in who's an adult. In this case, you know, what's the hardest thing to find out is how much gold does the West actually have? I am a super sleuth, Paul. I am a great researcher. And I know other people who are even better researchers in this space. And we all just shrug and go, who knows? No audits performed on the U.S.'s gold in Fort Knox. Mm -hmm. We don't know how much is in various vaults. It's super secret. But don't worry, it's a barbarous relic, Chris. Nobody really cares about it. We're just going to not have any transparency into the space. You know, you can't have both those things. So I've always been suspicious. So here's a little thing. I, I know a guy who, who runs a big refinery in Switzerland. And two things he says first they have a sign over the receiving door that if you see any of these state mint marks from china you get a reward so anybody who's on the loading docks pulling gold in for refining because so no gold ever leaves china nobody's found one like there's no mint marks like when gold is is manufactured in china and gets a mint mark on it it's that's so the last time it's so rare they incentivize their employees to look for them yep that's impressive Yep. And he said they have this tattered sign. It's been up for years. Nobody's ever found one. Right. So 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 they were just they're, they're keeping an eye out because if suddenly a bunch of Chinese state mint marks showing up, you got an idea. Right. The second thing is that the quality of the bars they are getting out of London, they have bar numbers on them and they've been tracking them. And he said, we're hitting the bottom of somebody's vaults. We're hitting mint marks that were poured in the 50s and 60s. Right. And some of this stuff is kind of substandard. This isn't three nines gold. This is like 0.925, whatever. It's like, yeah, wow. you know, it, it's stuff, right? You can clearly see like where they poured bars, where they just sort of melted down some other stuff in a haste. And so there's start some, you know, we're down to the dusty crevices of some vaults, right? So the idea here I'm getting to, and I will get there eventually, is that, is that the West will run out of gold for this little enterprise of running its little narrative machine of pretending like the price of gold is is low to pretend like the markets the price of gold approves of western decisions right mm -hmm. i think we're getting to the end of that story and that's why i showed that that it's really weird to have the price of gold going up in london to still be hemorrhaging gold i, I think someday we run out someday we admit it's not a barbarous relic and we've committed too much to this project of suppressing the price china's mm -hmm. bought it all they called our bluff and they're going to have to say we can't sell anymore and then the question for you is what happens then do you think the price just rises because that's what should happen or does the west pass laws against you and me owning gold again where, where do you think they go with that well one the price is going to rise dramatically if that's the case but i'm concerned about capital controls if that takes place <laughs> you know my mm -hmm. my concern is is hey we're going to lock you into the system you're not going to be able to move money overseas and i haven't thought about this in a long time me neither so, well i haven't thought about the capital controls in a long time until you mentioned that but i could be wrong on this but there was somewhere it was a pretty big deal back in 2012 or 2013 it was a silent you know, banking system kind of infrastructure build that they could limit you to three thousand dollars a day. Do you remember anything about that, Chris? As far as transfers, oh, small, back yeah, and bells forth? are ringing, but not enough to well. Opine. You know, let, let's just assume that I'm completely off on that because I've not thought of it in years. But I, I would not be surprised at all to limit because from from that standpoint, Chris, what's this government that's indebted in a foolish and ridiculous, evil, sinful way? In my opinion, just call it like it is. Mm -hmm. um it is so ridiculously foolish so if 
if that event happens and investors start chasing gold, what are they going to be selling? If the rest of the world's selling the treasuries, U.S. investors aren't just going to blindly continue to hold treasuries. They're going to chase. So the only way they're going to be able to uh, at least limit the hemorrhaging is capital controls and, and limitation on how you can move your funds. So my concern has been for a long time. And one of the reasons why I'm a strong advocate of people that we meet first, if they have an emergency fund to get through and make sure that's why we do the financial uh, plan or analysis on them is to make sure they have some assets that they can allocate from a long-term insurance standpoint, inflationary insurance, chaos insurance to some gold mm -hmm. that when you purchase it, you know, if it's five, 10%, I, I like 10% of your liquid assets. Now you got $10 million in land. You don't necessarily need 10% of gold in that land. That land can be a good asset, especially if it's got resources, farmland, timber, you know, commodities that we can use on it, but 10% and no different than the fire insurance you have on your home. Okay. Because if you're an, if you're an individual that has that, and let's say your broker dealer that you're working with is like, Hey, we're not even going to let you buy gold here. Or if you do, your advisor is not going to be compensated. So they set the incentives up to where nobody buys gold through them. And quite frankly, as bad as I hate to say it, I really believe it has to do with the fact that there's very little fees that can be charged and revenue shared on gold with those big institutions. They look at, it, you know, you got all these new Bitcoin, uh, uh, Bitcoin products, you've got fees that are in there and they can share those fees. It generates revenue. I know gold ETF have fees in there too, but it's not quite as profitable as some of the others. But you buy that, you set your mind that, hey, this is something I'm setting no different than fire insurance on my home. I'm going to set it aside. And I'm going to hope 10 years from now that it's the same price as it is today. But if that event that you're, you're talking about there, Chris, uh, unfolds, you know, even if you haven't invested into it relatively heavy or you've got an advisor like us who has tools that can overweight precious metals and commodities in your portfolio, you're going to be better off than what I would assume right now. I don't know the data on how many people have gold, but they are far and few between out there. Mm -hmm. You're going to be better protected than the average individual. So even if you just look at it as insurance from a long term standpoint, there's something going on behind the scenes right now that we'll find out in time. There are people that know. And my question is, are those people that know, you know, allocating towards gold and giving up on waiting for pullbacks? So I, I do think that it's possible that they'll implement capital controls at some point in the future. And that's why it's important to make those decisions now ahead of time before that event comes. I hope it doesn't happen. I really hope it doesn't. We, we need free markets. But I don't see how those that are in power right now, they're so willing to make foolish decisions, lie and cover their own sins per se, that they're going to just wake up one day and go, Hey, I'm going to admit, I don't think they've listened to Jordan mm -hmm. Peterson talk about the importance of the truth and the journey you follow after that. Cause you know, they're trying yes. to slaughter him in every way they can. So I just don't see that event coming. I, I think they'll, they'll run the system into the ground before they would admit their, their evil deeds behind closed doors. I agree. I, I that's how I analyze it. I, um, you know, I, I ran across, uh, there's a number of charts that, that, you know, people like, oh, Chris, you, you know, you're, you're much too conspiratorial. You, you know, you think the markets are rigged. I'm like, I don't think it, I know it. Yeah. And I can show you that if you bought like the, starting from 1993, when they started futures trading in the U S stock markets, if you had bought the cash open and sold the cash open. So the U.S. stock markets open at 9.30, they close at four. So if you'd bought and sold, so you just, don't, you just held it when they say, oh, investors this, investors that, you know, you think about the stock market and people mm -hmm. and papers and freight jackets and screens. If you had bought and sold, you were up like 25% over the past 30 years. But if you had bought the overnight market where the futures are traded, <laughs> right? <laughs> That was, you were up like 1200%. Like all the action was already done. It happened in the overnight when there's no humans mm -hmm. involved. Mostly it's just computers trading futures. And that's where I think you watch, they, they set the price, right? So same story for the past 20 years, Paul, if you bought silver during the open of the U S open here, when, when prices are set in the U S comics paper markets, if you bought silver at the beginning of the day, sold it at the end of the U S trading day, your silver over the past 23 years. 20 years is worth 13 cents an ounce. Oh however, however, that's what it traded down to over that whole time. However, if you bought it during, as soon as the markets closed in the U S held it overnight and sold right before they opened again, 
So you're holding it during the rest, when the rest of the world is doing it, uh, engaging with it. Silver is worth $373 an ounce. Wow. So I can tell you very simply, the rest of the world buys and the U.S. sells. Mm -hmm. That's what we've been doing. And I'll tell you why we do it, because somebody makes money doing it. And they've done it long enough that it's just what they do and they make money. And no regulator has stepped in and said, that's not a market because the regulator is from the government. The government likes that behavior. That's if those right. people were manipulating those prices the other direction and at driving the price of gold and silver up, oh my gosh, SEC, CFTC, Senate investigations, mm -hmm. DOJ, you'd be, they'd be all over that. But because they're doing it in the right direction, here we are. So I know that sounds like, ah, that's terrible. I love buying subsidized silver and gold. That's what I've been doing this whole time. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, it takes patience. It takes an understanding of the reason why you're doing it. And, and, mm -hmm. and it's, it's hard for investors to do that because I don't watch CNBC. I don't watch the major mainstream media. Uh, so, I mean, I'll, I hear what people are talking about and every now and then I'll take a look just to say, are they really saying what they're saying they're saying? Mm -hmm. But, um, but the reality is it's just patience, paying attention and discipline from a long-term standpoint. And, you know, I, I believe that when we get in the future, we're going to look back and people are going to go, wow, you know, I missed a great opportunity to be averaging into and taking some of my revenue and purchasing into that volatility of prices go along. Because I think mm -hmm. once that train is left, leaves the station and I'm, I could argue that the train has left the station now, but there's still time to get on for those that's appropriate for their situation. You're just going to have to run a little to catch it. Um, you know, it's not coming back. Right. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. when you have this big of an area of consolidation, this much money printing and this many things that that are coming apart around the world, deglobalization, there's one asset that you can verify the trust. Right. It's been the most trusted asset throughout history until another system emerges that can verify trust that has all of the 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 background workings under the light for everybody to see instead of in a back corner hidden in the dark yeah and um trust is is so people say money has three qualities right it has to be a store of value a medium of, of account right um and medium exchange and a unit of account sorry mangled that last part but yeah those that's the, actually i there's a fourth it has to have and that's trust mm -hmm. right because they always leave that last part out. I don't know why they always say it has these three characteristics. No, it has to have the trust. Because as soon as, like, like when the U.S. during Revolutionary War times, they went off of the gold and silver standard, mostly a silver standard, right? Mm -hmm. And decided to start printing script, they called it, mm -hmm. right? You know, and they printed that part of that was continentals, right? Not worth mm -hmm. a continental was a saying for d generations because it was just, it, it went the way of all paper money, right? It, it, mm -hmm. People didn't trust it. And how could they? Somebody could just make up as much as they wanted, and the British were counterfeiting it to undermine the society, and that's why I have a complaint about the Federal Reserve, because when you undermine a society by printing currency, you are a traitor to that country. Yes, <laughs> You're you at are. war with that country, so don't undermine your currency, right? But leaving right. that aside, we have to trust, and that's what you and I have been sort of nipping around the edges of this whole time, is that, is that people are, have lost trust, and I think for good reason, mm -hmm. because the Federal Reserve has not behaved in a trustworthy manner. They won't let us audit them. Won't, what do you mean won't let us? You're a public yeah. institution. We've entrusted yeah. you with the most important thing possible. And I want to know, at a, at a transaction level detail, who are you sending money to? Is it your mm -hmm. Uncle Bob? Is it some weird Cayman outfit that's then suddenly a huge purchaser of treasuries? So it's a stealth monetization of, of national debt? I deserve to know because this is going to impact my children's inflation and financial and monetary futures. Yes, it is. Well, and, and I would argue that if Bernie Madoff had the power to be able to keep from being audited, he would still be the best performing asset manager on Wall Street and, and be paraded around as, you know, the best. So mm -hmm. it's ridiculous that we don't have the ability to audit them because then you get to really know what's going on behind the service. You know, and, and kind of going back to the great taking thing, one of the things we've been exploring is how can we help people deal directly yes. in Treasury Direct, right? So one of the things we have to do that's considered custody over the assets, you have to have surprise random audits on the accounts that you, you do that. And that's important because 
it verifies and makes sure that the client's best interests are taken care of. Why can't we, as the people, like you said, be able to verify that the Federal Reserve is doing what's in the best interest of the American people versus the best interest of those in their circle of influence? Yep. And thank you for bringing up the great taking again. I'm almost done with the series. So if anybody hasn't watched that yet, it's uh, at peakprosperity.com, uh, my sister website. And uh, it's also on YouTube uh, and all that. So the great taking, really important. It's a set of legal rules that have been stood up. And, and it's all around the fact that our stocks and bonds and most financial assets are held in what's called indirect ownership model. It has some pros and cons. You should probably know about the cons. Um, and and so, uh, Paul, we're going to be having a, uh, in about a month, month and a half, we're going to have a webinar, which just talks about exactly what people can do and what maybe you can't do to respond to, uh, these, these, well, the rules as, as they've been written. Um, what are they? I'm, I'm shocked at the lack of fiduciary responsibility in communicating those. Mm -hmm. I've got brokerage accounts. Nobody ever told me any of this stuff, right? You know? I, I went through the terms of service agreement on, on, a, on a whole giant, on a brokerage account, 54 pages. They didn't detail any of this stuff. Mm -mm. No. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> I, still, so, I still remember the first time I read the book, I was like, I just sat it down, put my hand on my head, and I was like, <laughs> I can't believe this. Like I've been in the industry yeah. 20, this long, and nobody has ever mentioned this before. Mm -hmm. And and for yeah. you listeners out there, if, if you have not gone through Chris's series up to this point, you've got eight now, right? You just finished mm -hmm. with SIPC. Yep. You've got to go out. It is worth your time to listen to it. It's information. We don't have all the answers yet. we got a few, but you need to take the time to go listen to it. it you know, it, it's not necessarily going to be fun, but it's information you need to know about because if these triggers are pulled... You know, you don't have to have everything protected, but you, but if you have something protected, you're going to be better off than the average individual. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely, indeed. So, um, well, I see we're, we're up on our time here, Paul. So I just want to remind everybody that if you would like to talk to Paul and his amazing team at Kiker Wealth Management, just come on by peakfinancialinvesting.com, a very simple form. Email gets kicked out. You'll be notified. Paul, uh, I understand you've been very busy of late, um, you know, uh, talking with people who share our outlooks and concerns. And so thank you yes. for doing that. And thank you for helping people. And it's just been nothing but A1, you know, plus feedback so far. So thank you for doing what you're doing. Thank you. It's my honor. And I tell you what, I have thoroughly enjoyed meeting. And, and, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again, some of the most intelligent, courageous, truth-loving and truth-seeking people that are out there. And, you know, it, it's just, it's given me such a hope that, that yes, we have a, a small remnant of individuals inside the United States and not necessarily small. I don't mean small. I'm talk, just talking about in relation to the overall population that, that care about doing what's right, that care about integrity. And, and they're, they realize that, that the path that we're heading down right now is unsustainable and they're looking for individuals that can help them. And uh, it's just been such an honor to meet people and, and you know help help show them that where they are talk about ways to prepare and have those conversations across the board it's really fun when i could get somebody that has enough resources we can go through it doesn't matter if they don't but you know it's it's we help people get where they are but then there's individuals that can really expand their diversification of protection because um you know so it's an honor it's an honor to meet people well, thank you. It, 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 it's such an honor to, to be in, in uh, business relationship with you around this. And um, as we mentioned, as we talked about in last week's episode, it's not just you and I saying this is unsustainable anymore. It's now the U.S. Treasury Department yes. telling us that the United States is on an absolutely unsustainable fiscal trajectory, which is a euphemism for careening towards a brick wall. And mm -hmm. I think once you're notified about that, you have to do something about it because in this day and age, Paul, no decision is a decision. And I know it's tough, but You're people right. do have to look at square on and just say, I, I wish I, it didn't have to be this way, but it is. So now what do we do? And so thank you for helping people figure out those answers to those thorny questions. It's my pleasure. Hello, Chris Martinson. I'm the CEO of Peak Prosperity and also Peak Financial Investing. And after watching that, 
you're probably wondering, well, what do I do with my money? Look, you both deserve and need somebody who can talk to you about what's really going on in this world, understand the situation as it is, not be steering you towards certain things that don't make sense for you or just keep you in a game that's already ended. Look, if you want to talk to somebody about the petrodollar declining or what is happening with gold or which sectors are actually the best ones to be in, given what the Federal Reserve is up to or the federal government, you deserve to talk to somebody who can answer those and has a few gray hairs and has been there through some of the economic cycles because, hey, we're in another economic cycle, so it's good to have that experience. Fortunately, at Peak Financial Investing, what we do is we go out and we scour and we look for the very best firms out there who satisfy one thing above all else. They've got great experience coupled to great customer service. So if you want to come by peakfinancialinvesting.com, there's a very simple form you can fill out. Just a few fields. You hit send. What happens is an email gets triggered out. It goes to uh, an endorsed firm of ours. You will get an email back. You can then set up a phone call for a 30 to 45 minute free, no obligation, no pressure call to find out if this firm is a good fit for you and to find out if you're a good fit for the firm. It has to go both ways. And if all that matches up, this will be one of the best things that could happen to you this year. So please come by peakfinancialinvesting.com. Very simple process. We would love to help you if we can. Thanks very much.